And once again, we are all the way live, baby. Let's go. Party people, the place to be. I go by the name of the BK Apologist, transmitting all the way live. New York is the city, Brooklyn is the borough. What's good? What's popping? It's Wednesday. Happy hump day to everybody. We're almost done with another week. And of course, the party people are in the building. We got my man, Mr. Phil Fox. What's going on, sir? We got the infamous, the indelible, the incredible Nate 2D2. We got my homegirl, Dean New, representing way up north. <laughs> way up north. You know what I mean? And I'm just glad that you guys are here. Definitely please tell a friend to tell a friend that's him again. You know what I mean? Coming through. You know? If you haven't yet, please share the link. You know? And if you're so inclined, go and show your love to your boy through PayPal. And, of course, I got to give a special shout-out to all my patrons who are in the building supporting this this incredible mission of conveying the gospel throughout the the realms of this world. So, I want to thank you so much for that. You know what I mean? So, <laughs> happy, happy pre-bodega. Pre-pre-bodega day. Yes, yes. We can't wait to get into that. In fact... In, in about, what, two weeks, we're going to have the Bodega ladies come in and take over the Bodega. And um, it's going to be great. And because we're going to have Dean New as one of the the people on the platform. And the ladies are going to show us how it's properly done. You know, and they're going to give us their insight as only godly women can. So we're looking forward to that. we got my man Black Atheist in the building. What's good? What's going on? So... Without further ado, let me get into the subject matter at hand, which is the Christian contribution to science. And I did a previous video just talking about all the great things Christianity has either invented or innovated or improved. But what I want to do today is kind of drill down specifically on science. And the reason why I want to do that, peace, Angel, what's going on, sir? And the reason why I want to do that is because, you know, unfortunately, Christians have gotten a bad rap when it comes to science. That somehow we don't like science. In fact, that people believe we are anti-science. You know, and I was looking at a, a couple of memes that really bring that point home. Right? Here's one. Uh, you have the periodic table of elements, right? 1869 by Dmitry Mendeleev, Right? But then Kansas has their own periodic table of elements, which is just earth, fire, air, and water, right? That we're against plate tectonics, we're against the Big Bang, right? We're, we're anti-science, right? So I thought that was interesting. And what about uh, this one here? Science adjusts its views based on what's observed. Faith is the denial of observation so that belief can be preserved. Now, obviously, no one is taking the time to really understand what biblical faith is, right? Faith isn't the denial of observation because we understand that science, part of science is being able to observe nature and to look at patterns, reoccurring patterns in nature, right? Faith, biblical faith, simply means to have a conviction on what you do know. So if that is the proper definition of faith, then scientists are very faithful people because they base their convictions on things, on things that they understand to be true, right? The Christian does the same thing. But again, we keep saying that to them. They don't want to listen to us, right? Here's another one, right? Religion is, in fact, scientific blasphemy. But what's interesting about this meme, and they use this meme a lot, to, to really go at Christians. And I don't think they understand the location of this place, right? Because this is at Trinity College. 
officially the, the the actual true title of this college is the College of the Holy and Undivided Trinity of Queen Elizabeth near Dublin, right? So they like using this to show how bright they are, but it's like, but this library is created with believers in mind. So I find that very, very, very interesting. All right. Give me a minute here. Let me get out of this for a second. All right. Boom. There's another one. Science. Ruining everything since four, since 1543. Right? I, I, was, I don't understand what how this gets ruined. But it talks about, you know, of course, it ruins the idea of God creating man. And the unicorn. Which is interesting, because you might say, what does Christianity have to do with unicorns? Well, when you look at the older English translations in the Bible, you find the word unicorn being used. Now, what they don't tell you is that these earlier, you know, manuscripts were in Latin and they would use, you know, Latin terms to describe different animals, right? And there's an animal that we know as the rhino, right? But the Latin term would be unicornius. So in English, unicornius would be unicorn. So that's what the King James and, and older Bibles are saying. They're not talking about, they're talking about an actual animal that existed, not a unicorn. Right? It's about a rhino, the biconius. That's the name of, of a... There's, there's also uh, unicornius and biconius. There's, there's rhinos that have two horns. Right? So, so people don't dig deep at all. You know, it's not, there isn't mythical creatures in the Bible. Unless it's being used in a polemical fashion. Right? Because I think in one of the Psalms it talks about how God d smashes the heads of Leviathan. Well, when did that ever happen in the Bible? Well, it didn't. It's 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 poetic. It's it's poetic and it's polemic, right? It's going at another creation story. You know, it's not Baal that destroyed Leviathan. It's Yahweh, right? It's wordplay. It's 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 a diss track against this other creation story, right? So, let's look at another one here. You pray for me, I'll think for you. Again throwing a shot at believers that, you know, somehow we've disabled our ability to understand things because we pray, right? And of course, these guys know better. So, you know, they're thinkers. We're not. They're the brights, right? That's, that's what they call themselves, the brights, right? So, wait a minute. Here's another one. Too stupid to understand science? Try religion. Right? Another shot. Maybe some of you guys seen these before, you know. Uh, what I found funny is a meme that Frank Turbic just put up. And he says, science could prove everything. Really? Can you prove that statement with science? Right? So, they hate when we do stuff like that, you know. But, um, in William Wallace's book, Galileo and His Sources, it says here, historically, Christianity has been and still is the patron of sciences. It has been prolific in the foundation of schools, universities, and hospitals. And many clergy have been active in the sciences. Historians of science, such as Pierre Duhem, credit medieval Catholic mathematicians and philosophers, such as John Burden, Nicole Osame, and Roger Bacon, as the founders of modern science. So the fact that we have what we have today in science, we can thank these ancient believers in Jesus. You know, so who was really bright first? Right? That's that's the interesting thing. These guys tout themselves as these incredible brainiacs, not understanding that they're sitting on the so on the shoulders of believing scientists, right? And that's what we're going to do today. We're going to go through a list of believers who are scientists and we're going to see what they've innovated, what they've discovered, what they've created and their conviction about the gospel. Right? So we're going to start off with Louis Pasteur, right? He's the one who created the germ theory of disease, 
the law of biogenesis. He disproved spontaneous generation, which was an early evolutionary theory, uh, created the pasturation of food, developed vaccines for rabies and diphtheria, uh, I discovered anthrax, and he opposed Darwinism. And here's a quote from Mr. Pasteur. He says, could I but know all, I would have the faith of a Breton peasant woman. The more I study nature, the more I stand amazed at the work of the creator. And this was a, a, a sentiment that many scientists at that time had. It's because of God and how great he is. They wanted a better understanding of their creator. And this was the impetus of the pursuit of science, of understanding nature. Why? Because as we know in Romans, you know, if you know nature, then you start understanding the composer of it. Right. So let's continue. This is Joseph Lister. He originated antiseptic surgery. Also, I want you to think about this as well. As we go on and look at these, these innovations and, and discoveries, I want you to think, how would the world be different if these things weren't here today? Right. Antiseptic surgery using chemical disinfectants. We could just stop right there based on the worldwide pandemic. Right? One of our greatest things that we're using to fight the COVID is what? Chemical disinfectants. You know, everybody, you know, once you come into your house, what's the first thing you do? You wash your hands and then you put some sanitizer on your hands, right? Well, you could thank Joseph Lister for that. So imagine we didn't have these things. You know, but I guess we're too dumb to, 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 to help out when it comes to, you know, plagues and pandemics, right? He is only second only to Pasteur in saving human lives. He was the president of the British Association and the Royal Society of London. And here's a quote from Mr. Lister. He says, I am a believer in the fundamental doctrines of Christianity. It's funny how none of his theology got in the way of his brain capacity, right? In fact, I'm sure if you was to ask him that this is the, the inspiration for his, his scientific pursuits. We got George Washington Carver developed 325 products from peanuts and 188 from sweet potatoes. I don't know about you, but when I see a peanut, I, I, I just see a peanut or a potato. This man saw innovation and, and creation of all sorts. I mean, 325 products from peanuts. That's, that's, that's crazy. And here's what Mr. Carver has to say. I love to think of nature as an unlimited broadcasting station through which God speaks to us every hour. If we only will tune in, he's preaching right there. He's preaching, you know, there's a brilliant black man preaching the word of God and developing amazing things with things that we don't even, you know, we even care to think about like peanuts and potatoes, right? We got Raymond Damadian, inventor of the MRI machine, which has revolutionized modern diagnostic medicine. He is in the National Inventors Hall of Fame, National Medal for Technology. Think about that. I mean, what would the sports world be? Without, the, without this machine, without properly diagnosing what athletes' injuries are and helping them to recover, or just the populace, you know, in general. You know, all the things that we couldn't tell was hurting us until we got this machine. And what does Mr. Demodian have to say? He says here, the highest purpose a man can find for his life is to serve the will of God. If America is to be rescued, she must be rescued from the pulpit. Interesting that even back then, America was found to be in dire straits. And that the rescue comes from the gospel. Seems like nothing much has changed since. All right. Who else we got here? We have William of Ockham. Delineated rules of logic. Ockham's razor something many of us in apologetics are, are familiar with. 
the concept of keeping it simple. He was excommunicated for criticizing papal abuses for power. Sounds like he was a protester, right? And what does he say here? Wait. Oh, does he say anything? Hold on. Oh, I, don't, I forgot to put his quote. So we have, we're going to just keep it moving. We got Johannes Kepler, the father of celestial mechanics, the father of modern optics, pursued science as a mission from God. Let me say that again. Pursued science as a mission from God. He invented eyeglasses, telescopes, human vision, refraction, the three laws of planetary motion, and the pinhole camera. Many of us, you know, we're on YouTube, we're YouTubers, we're using webcams and DSR cameras, and thanks to Kepler, we're able to do that. Uh, if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't be able to stream right now. You know, how many of us wear glasses? You know, did you know that a believer was the one who created eyeglasses? A Christian? And what does he have to say? He says, since we are astronomers, are priests of the highest God in regard to the book of nature, it befits us to be thoughtful, not of the glory of our minds, but rather above all else of the glory of God. Again, it's just the wonderment and awe of God that inspired the pursuit of understanding the world that he created. They were fully using their capacity to understand and to de delineate. Why? Because God. Because of God. Not in spite of. We got William Harvey. First to fully describe the circulatory system, including valves, veins, and the rolls of the heart. How many of us deal with high blood pressure and hypertension? You know, and how, you know, to unblock arteries and veins. We have William Harvey to thank for that. He is the personal physician to King James I, a pioneer of modern embryology. And he says, life, therefore, resides in the blood, as we are informed in our sacred writings. So again, he's taking inspiration from the word of God in his pursuit of understanding what he has read. And because of that, the whole world benefits from one man's pursuit of understanding God that much more. We got Blase Pascal. He created barometers, syringes, the hydraulic press, the first mechanical calculator. You don't have to use your hands and feet now to count. You have a calculator because of Mr. Pascal. Now, of course, we're all familiar with Pascal's wager. He says, certitude, joy, peace, God of Jesus Christ, we keep hold of him only by the ways taught in the gospel. Renunciation, total and sweet, total submission to Jesus Christ and to my director. Eternally in joy for a day's training on earth. I will not forget thy words. Amen. Again, finding the inspiration of their of their awe and, and submission to Christ. We have Sir Isaac Newton, three laws of motion, the reflecting telescope, his Principia, the most significant science work. He is the co-inventor of calculus. Ca the co-inventor of calculus. That class that pretty much everybody hated in high school <laughs> was created by Sir Isaac Newton. The law of universal gravity, right? NASA owes a debt of thanks to, to Sir Isaac Newton. And he says, all my discoveries have been made in an answer to prayer. I have a fundamental belief in the Bible as the word of God written by men who were inspired. I studied the Bible daily. Yet somehow this doesn't retard his ability to create all these amazing things. Again, he takes inspiration from the word of God. 
He says, all my discoveries have been made and answered to prayer. That means he was talking to God about these things. He was seeking God's understanding. He was pursuing a wisdom that was not from this earth. And this is what he obtained in that pursuit. And we all benefit from one man's prayer life. <laughs> right? So when people say prayer is powerful, yeah, in more ways than you can even imagine. Then we have Robert Boyle, the father of chemistry, insisted on experimentation for scientific proof. Which is funny, right? Because isn't this the thing that atheists always love to come at us with? Well, we need proof. We need scientific proof. Yeah, th that idea comes from us. <laughs> the idea of wanting scientific proof and, and, and experimentation, that's from us. You're welcome. Right? Bo Boyle's law relates gas pressure to value. And this is what he says. From a knowledge of his work, we shall know him. So in Romans 1, <coughs> 18 to 20, it says God's wrath against sinful humanity. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature having been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. Paul basically is explaining natural theology. He's saying, of course we know God exists. Right? That we understand that to be a fact. Why? Because of nature. Right? Since the creation of, of the world, his invisible qualities, the things that we can't quite comprehend, we can through what's been made. And what science but the study of nature? So if you are actually looking at the data and you, you go where the data takes you, it takes you to the throne of God. I mean, that's what all these scientists that we just talked about did. They started with, well, this is God. This is God's creation. The better I know the, the nature of things, the better I understand God and the closer I become to him. It's like any other relationship, right? I, I always tell people, you know, imagine the spouse that you have. And the only thing you're ever going to know about that spouse is what you learn on those first two dates. How strong of a, of a relationship would that be? Be pretty flimsy, right? For any relationship to remain strong or to become stronger, you got to know the other person more than you did before. God is no different. We need to know God more and more. We need to have a deeper understanding. And that's what these scientists were striving for. They were striving to have a better understanding of God. And Oh, and by the way, we figured out the circulatory system. Oh, and by the way, we cured this disease. Oh, by the way, you know, because of this pursuit, we created the, the MRI machine. Oh, and by the way, you know, we created all these amazing things based on peanuts and potatoes. How crazy is that? Because they pursued a relationship with God, they obtained all of this. So imagine if these men did not think, you know, running after God to be a thing. How much would we be suffering right now if these men decided that, yeah, that's not a big deal? Where would we be as a society? With diseases and plagues that have always been around. It's just affecting, you know, us now in the Western world. But it's because of the, the, the foundation that these men have created. We have now a fighting chance against these things. And um, like my man here, Jones says, they subscribe to scientism, not science. Facts. Facts. Oh, wow. Carmel Crunk. Wow. This is great. 
This is great. So I, you have the historical footnote of being my first um, super chat. So thank you, Carmel. Wow, that's 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 big. Thank you so much. Um, no, I did. I was thinking of more of um, the older scientists, not so much Francis Collins. But you know, I could always do a part two. So I'll keep that in mind. So, oh yeah, and a side note, I, I thank you for making me a thousand subscribers. You know, thank you for supporting what I'm trying to do here. I'm very humbled by that. You know, so. But let me look at some of you guys' things here. I'm an engineer, so I love calculus. Yeah, well, you're weird. <laughs> I hate math with a passion. But luckily, we had Sir Isaac Newton. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't like calculus. So true. But thank you anyway. So, yeah, exactly. I will, I'm not a big fan, but we definitely need it, right? What else here? What else you guys are saying here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. A unicorn is a bull. It's, it's not a rhino? Is it from the same family, though, uh, Matthew? The unicornius? Oh, is it all rhino? Okay, yeah, I, I, it's 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 in that family tree, but it but it's definitely it wasn't a horse <laughs> with a horn sticking out of him. That that's for sure, for certain. Yeah. Yes, I, I am now open for super chat. Yes, I I forgot that that is the case now. So. But thank you. Oh, and by the way, Mr. Fox, I thought we was already friends on Facebook. I didn't realize that was in case until you made mention of it. So it wasn't like I was trying to dodge you or anything. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I just thought we were already friends. So, but um, thank you for your support, definitely. But again, guys, you know, it, it's, it's just so funny how people attack our belief, right? But they have to smuggle in our worldview to do that. Show us proof. Um, we're the ones that kind of showed you proof. <laughs> you didn't know you needed proof to begin with. It wasn't for the believers. Right? Like, you're welcome. We gave you that. You know? I mean, we've we given you so much. You know, MRI machines. You know, we believe in science. Uh, so did we. In fact, we believed in it way before you did. On certain aspects. Right? So... But listen, man, uh, any comments, questions about what we just discussed? What I just discussed? Anyone? Anyone? Let me see here. Let me... I just tweeted about Sir Isaac's quote about his fucking belief in Bible. Oh, okay. Yes, yeah, so, you know, great minds think alike. What can I tell you? You're a funny dude, Mr. White. I just got can you start over? You could we could watch the video again. <laughs> That's what you could do, Mr. White. <laughs> oh man, you guys are funny. So start over. You're a funny dude. Um But yeah, guys, I mean Oh wow. Yeah, let's do that. I, I would be honored. I would be honored, man. Let's 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 talk behind the scenes and figure that out. I, I would love to to jump in there, man. And, and and likewise, you know, I need you to get up. I need you to get up here too, so we could chop it up. You know, you felt privileged for a second. Yeah, sorry, Bo. You know how the world is. <laughs> it was too short. Next time, make it longer. I was actually trying to make it long. You know, but at the same time, you know, that they say that YouTubers shouldn't make their videos but like 30, 35 minutes, you know. So even though, you know, many of, you know, we break that rule all the time. But um, but yes, Barker, I, I will definitely keep that in mind, you know. But, you know, it was a lot of stuff. It was a lot of different people, a lot of different inventions. You know, I want to make sure it was able to um, absorb that. Okay, here's a question. Can we get signs from the Bible? Um, yes and no. Yes and no. I, I feel like God, you know, 
always dealt with people at the level of science that they were at. Right. So and, and me and you, we both know that we're big fans of, of, of John Walton, and his understanding of of Genesis and and how God would would speak in their level. Right. Like God, God didn't introduce new scientific phenomena. You know, he always worked within the confines of their understanding of science at that day. You know, God never said, thus say of the law, the law. And then, by the way, here's quantum physics. Right? He never did that. Right. So, you know, if the world is flat or, you know, the the heart is the seat of knowledge. Right. And things like that. You know, some of that's poetic. Some of it was just what they understood science to be at the time, you know. But I think the the Bible does give us the ability to do good science. You know, it, it talks about having a discernible heart. And, and, you know, one of the greatest commandments is to use your mind, right? When they ask Christ what the greatest commandment is, love the Lord your God with all your soul, strength, mind, and strength. You know, and... Throughout the Bible is replete with, with instructions of meditating and to think things through and, and think these things out and, and prayer. Like there's a lot of mental exercising going on, you know, throughout the Bible. And I feel like the Bible does give us the tools to do good science. Even if there is, even though the Bible is not itself a science book. So I hope that kind of helps. What we got here? The excellent book to read is God and Stephen Hawking by John Lennox. Yeah, I like John Lennox. He's, he's, he's brilliant and fiery at the same time. I like him a lot. Right, that's not the Bible's emphasis, but there's plenty of science application. I, I would agree with that. I wasn't here, so excuse me if you answer this. Can science be viewed as God's progressive revelation? Uh, well, Romans... Right. When Paul's writing to the Romans, he's basically saying that it, it's through science that men are not that men are without excuse. Right. You know, um, actually, let me let me look at that again. Let me share that with you. I'll share this one slide with you, Mr. White, but I'm not going to do the whole video over with you. <laughs> All right. But just for you, because because I like you, you're my guy. All right, here we go. God's wrath against sin sinful humanity. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. For God, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature has been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that People are without excuse, right? So we know that science is, is about observable phenomenon and being able to repeat and observe that phenomenon, right? Paul is saying because of our study of nature, which is that's what science is, the study of nature, because of that, men now do not have an excuse when it comes to following God. In fact, he says that men suppress the truth. It's like being in a swimming pool and having a balloon, right? And trying to keep the balloon on the water. You have to apply pressure because if not, it comes back up. You know, so Paul is, is advocating natural theology. It's like if you study the world, you're going to come to the conclusion that many of our famous scientists came to. There is a God and he is alive. You know, and those who don't come to that conclusion, according to, to Paul, it's because they're suppressing the truth. It's not that they don't understand it. They're suppressing it, right? They're, they're making a conscious effort not to think about the, the, the end result of their pursuit of knowledge. All right, so I hope that helps. That's the only slide you're going to get. You got to watch the whole video. <laughs> All right. Sorry about that. What is your stance on a worldwide flood? Many scientists disagree with the notion of that. Um, I lean towards a local flood, but I'm not dogmatic about it. If someone could give me a better, uh, argument for a worldwide flood, I, I'd be more than happy to, to change. But, um, 
I do believe that it's a local flood. And when I mean local, I'm not saying that it was just a four block radius, right? I'm talking about the entire Levant region, right? What we now call the ancient Near East was completely deluged, right? Mm -hmm. So this is a major chunk of the planet was underwater. So when people say local, sometimes people think it's just three blocks. It's like, no. It was such a big deal that every other society knew about it and, and wrote about it themselves, right? So local, that locale. Right, local, locale. I'm sorry, I'm Puerto Rican. Sorry. Um, it was a local worldwide flood. Well, yeah, because in th from their perspective, it was worldwide, right? It happened within what they understood the world to be. So even though you was being funny, you, you kind of have, you, you have a point, Mr. Phil Fox, you know? So yes, I believe there was a major, major catastrophic extension low event did occur. Right. But I don't know if it was the whole world, but it was a major chunk of the world. So that's that's my. But and I'm not dogmatic on that. I'm more than happy to change my stance if people could show me just some more, you know, data on that. But for now, I lean towards a local flood. So you guys, so you want a part two? I will work on that. Yamina, I will definitely work on that. So. But. You know what, guys? I'm gonna. I'm definitely gonna keep it short. You know, we're gonna come back uh, Friday. You know, the book and bodega. Make sure you guys are in attendance. We're gonna be talking about a whole bunch of stuff. You know. Yeah, yeah. Me and you. Yeah, we believe in rigid. Right, right. Definitely. But again, you know, it it doesn't take away from God's power either. You know what I mean? The fact that he that he just called upon this major flood on that part, part of the world and it happened, it's still amazing. <laughs> right? So, uh, we got Phil Fox here. There is evidence that the world the flood was worldwide. Research the great... Okay. I will look into that. Like I said, I'm not dogmatic about it. But understand, I believe when the Bible says there was this flood of catastrophic proportions, I believe that. 100%, right? And I believe that they believe that it was a worldwide flood. And I believe that God did it to de destroy the wickedness that was pervasive on the land. I totally believe that. And so does Carmel. So I don't want you guys thinking Carmel's a heretic or anything. We both believe that, you know. I, what we question is the extent of the flood. Not the power or the intent or the person that caused it. We all believe that. That was Yahweh. I'm just saying, I don't know how big it was for now, you know, so I, and I lean, right? I'm not, I, I would never preach a, 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 a local flood, right? I, I would keep that to myself. You know what I mean? But if you're asking me personally, yeah, I lean based on what I've read. I lean towards a regional flood. Yeah. So, what up, Sister Lala? Yeah, man, I, I look at all that stuff. I I am more than happy to change my stance. Like, I am not dogmatic. So, you know, so. And again, when I say regional, when me and Carmel say regional, we're saying a good chunk of the planet <laughs> was underwater quickly, right? So, Please don't think, you know, we're talking about like just Jerusalem was flooded. Like, no, we're talking about everything from Northeast Africa all the way down to Arabia all the way down. I mean, all of that was flooded, right? So, but, um, but yeah, you know, so I, yeah, so I, Carmel's more, I guess, hard nosed about it than I am. I, but I, I definitely do lean towards the original flood. You know what I mean? So, I'm not a heretic. I believe in the inspired doctrine of the Bible, the triune God. <laughs> I believe you saved through faith, through grace. I believe in the inerrancy of scripture. <laughs> All right? And I definitely believe in the flood. And I believe it did what it's supposed to do, and I believe that God sent it. Oh, I'm just, my beef is just the, the length. That's it. The length of the flood. Is it as big as we think in modern times? Right? Because I'm, I'm trying to think about, how, you know, 
in their world, of course, they're going to say it's a worldwide flood from their perspective. But is it our perspective? You know what I mean? So, but that's it. That's all I want to say. I believe in the flood. I believe it was ordained by God. I believe it actually happened. And I believe it worked to a certain extent because, you know, men were still sinning afterwards. But, you know, it's something that we can we can rely on. I believe it's true. I believe it's a historical fact that this huge extension level event known as the flood did occur. So, yeah. So I hope everybody still likes me. <laughs> And don't unsubscribe. <laughs> I believe in the flood. I believe in the flood. So. But yeah, guys. So um, I think with that. Yeah, they found. Two, yeah, yeah. No, everybody knew about this event. This event didn't happen in the corner. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, but it could be something along the lines of 9-11, right? 9-11 happened in New York, but the whole world knew about it. And everybody had their take on that catastrophic event. Yeah. So. No, bro. It's always good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I don't, I don't want you guys coming with pitchforks and flaming torches to come get me. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know. Oh, I, my, my, I only questioned the, 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 the length and, and how big. It was big. How big? That's all I'm saying. How big? So, but, um, yeah, so with that being said, guys, I think we're going to stop it right here and, uh, no way. <laughs> so, um, right. So, you know, people like, uh, Heiser, uh, Walton, you know, they definitely subscribe to the original flood and they make compelling arguments for it, you know, but I'm, I'm here to listen to compelling arguments arguments for an actual worldwide flood. I'm here for that too. But either way, God did it. And it, you know, and, and it's something that we have to be aware of. It, it something that helps us to be in reverent fear of God. Cause God does not play when it comes to sin. That's why he did what he did. Right. And we know that fire is coming next. And those of us who are not right with God are going to experience that. And that's why we're here, so that people do not experience the fire, right? So, and with that being said, guys, so let me do this. All right, so this is the BK Apologist signing off. Catch you at the bodega this Friday. One.